Truly, God is good. And there is no God like our God. A God who is merciful, a God who absolutely loves us. As always, it's good to be in the house of the Lord. We give God uh, praise unto God. And we count it a privilege to be in his house. It's not drudgery. It's not a punishment. But it's a place of worship where we decide to come to give God uh, praise. I'm going to use a Bible reading this morning which comes from the Gospel of Jesus Christ according to Luke. The Gospel according to Luke. And I'm going to be in chapter 2. Chapter 2 starting at verse 41. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. When they had fulfilled the days as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, with a, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintance. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wish ye not that I must be about my father's business? And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. And then I would like to redirect your attention to verse 49. This is going to be my text. And he said unto them, how is it that ye sought me? Or how is it that you were searching for me? Wishing not that I must be about my father's business. And I'm preaching this morning with the help of the good Lord on a message entitled, Serious Business. Serious Business. Reverend Palmer, can you please pray, sir? Father, we thank you for this privilege, O oh God, to be able to be in your house this morning, to hear and to receive from you, O oh God. Continue, O oh God, to draw us closer unto you this morning. Tug at our hearts, O oh God. Deal with our lives this morning. And as your preaching goes forth this morning, we ask you that your divine will to be done in our lives. Help us, O oh God, right now. Help Pastor to minister unto us this morning. We'll give you all the glory and the praise in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Serious business. The work of God is always needful, timely, and serious. There's no time to waste because people die every day outside of the will of God. A lost lamb in Africa is as dear as to the heart of God as is the one that is in Canada. God loves them in the rainforest of Brazil and also in the train stations of Japan. We should care as the Lord cares and see as the Lord sees. We are chosen agents to reach a lost and dying world. An advance must be made to bring people the gospel to those who have not heard. God had an only son and he made him a missionary. We cannot bring the world to Christ but we can take Christ to the world. God's vision is a world vision. We have to be something before we can do something. We cannot give to others what we do not have. Expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. Talk is cheap. I'll borrow some of that from my, my Bible school notes from practical theology. And would you believe it or not today, that is still relevant for us. Because it's a true statement. You see, the business of God, it involves reaching out to souls. And we'll talk some more about that in a little bit. But before we talk about that, I want to talk about uh, the business of Mary and Joseph, or Christ's parents' business. 
See, the annual pilgrimage to Jerusalem was customary for many who lived outside the city. The laws commanded three pilgrimages for the men each year, Passover, Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles, according to Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 16. So here in our Bible setting, we have this, this story or this account, which can only be found here in the book of Luke. And I would say that the book of Luke gives us more insight about uh, the ministry and the early life of Jesus Christ. Other than him being born uh, in, in a manger, uh, we, we have this uh, a boyhood account. And even in some, of these, in some of these verses, we still don't know a whole lot about what he was doing when he was that young. We don't read anything about him as a teenager. Uh, so it kinda, we deal with some stuff here and then we just fast forward to his, his uh, his earthly ministry when he was in his early 30s. So uh, there's a lot of supposition that, that could be made in here. And I'm not gonna really spend a whole lot of time uh, talking about that. Because some people, they have some weird concepts and things about God. And they worry about things or ask questions that really don't, there, there's no real need for it. God gives us so much in his word already. If he wanted us to know more, he would have put more in there. So we want to look at his parents' business. Now this was legitimate worship. The Passover or Pesach is a commemoration of how God delivered his people out of Egypt. It is a feast of freedom kept with prayers and a special meal. And many times they would sing songs of liberation. So these, uh, this, this holiday is still practiced among the Jews today. It's something that is very special. And it's a reminder really of what God has done for us. And I kind of, I think I talked about some of these things during Easter. The book of Matthew chapter 26 verses 17 and 18 says, Now the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying unto him, Where will thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? And he said, Go into the city to such a man, and say unto, say unto him, The master saith, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 7 Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. You see, the Passover perhaps means something a little bit different to Christians. But ultimately, between the Jews and the Christians, the concept is still the same. Okay, that lamb uh, without spot, without blemish was going to be a sacrifice. We go back to the book of Exodus and how that God was sending this last plague uh, uh, through the land. And, and wherever the, the blood of the lamb uh, was not applied to the doorpost of that house, then the destruction of God was going to come through and, and those children were going to die. And some would even perhaps look at that as something so strange, weird, or even perhaps mean. But when God gives us a command, uh, we need to keep it. And really, it's it's only for our good. It's only for our benefit. If we knew what was good for us, we too would take the blood of the lamb and apply it to our lives uh, so that we could be saved from destruction. God is a good God. He's merciful. So his parents were doing what they were supposed to be doing. They were keeping up with the customs and the traditions of the land. They weren't doing anything sinful. But I want to point out something here. The Bible tells us as, as they were, they would go up here every year to Jerusalem. And when Christ was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. When they had fulfilled the days as they returned, the, child's, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. So the Lord had stayed behind. His parents went forth, and the Bible tells us in verse 44, they, supposing, of course, talking about uh, Mary and Joseph, they supposing him to have been in the company. They went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinsfolk, their kinsfolk and acquaintance. So they went for quite a while, um, not realizing that Christ wasn't even with them. They didn't realize it at first. And then when they did realize that he wasn't with them, they began to search for him. Now, many things could be shared about this, but I want to look at this word here, supposing. It comes from the Greek word nomos, and it means anything established, anything received by usage, a custom, a law, the rule of action prescribed by reason, a principle. 
So it's safe to say that they, 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 they thought it was, or they didn't think it was strange, and, and believing that Christ was still with them. They didn't think that this was the custom for them to, to be traveling with him and taking him to different places. Nothing seemed weird or, or out of the norm. And it's noteworthy that this word nomos is very similar to our word in the English language, normal. And so they, you could honestly look at it without taking it really out of context. You know, they, they thought it was normal for Christ to be with them. They didn't think it was weird or strange. Then all of a sudden he wasn't there anymore or any longer. They did not know where Jesus was. They got their eyes off of Jesus. Now we don't know exactly what happened. There was a bunch of people around. And, but you know, to, be, to go even a, a whole hour or so without your child, that's an hour too long. Especially in our day and age. All it takes is just a few minutes for, for a child to get snatched up by a predator. Someone that's willing or, uh, to do something harm and wrongful to a child. It, it doesn't take long. But so to even go an hour is, is quite a while. To go a day, my goodness, uh, in, in, uh, again, in our time, our day and age, uh, that parent may never see that child again alive. May never see the child at all for the rest of their life. But there are many supposing or thinking it's normal that God is with them, but he's not. They get their eyes off of Jesus. Many think that Christ is with them. And I don't know, there could be a number of reasons that I have a few here. Perhaps many times people get over familiar with God. I heard this already. <laughs> this is boring. God is love. He won't judge me. I'm good. I have time. I can go to church when I, when I feel like it. Another thing, why people may think God is with them, because they may be doing something sinful and they don't think there's anything wrong with their sin. In other words, the enemy normalizes sin. Cultural norms oftentimes defy logic or God himself. Scripture reference in Isaiah chapter 5, it says, Woe unto them that call evil good, and good evil, that put darkness for light, and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet, and sweet for bitter. It says, Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes, and prudent in their own sight. Some people don't, you know, you could take something what we would consider terrible or wrong, but in someone else's mind, it's perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with what they're doing. In fact, they even tell you that God understands. In other words, it's okay for me to be doing what I'm doing, even though it's outside of the word of God. God understands. He knows. He's not going to judge me. He's a good God. He loves me. It's okay. But see, if we start making excuses for one sin, then we can make excuses for every sin. And we'll tell ourselves all day long that there's nothing wrong with what I'm doing. That's your definition of wrong. That's not my definition. That's your definition of, 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 of normal, but my definition is something uh, totally different. You know, we may look at someone walking down the street, you know, someone with some spiked hair and it's like five different colors and, and they have all kinds of tattoos on them and piercings, man, piercings in their eyebrow, piercings in their ear and their lip, their tongue, we may look at that and be like, man, they're strange, that's weird. But in their eyes and in the eyes of many others, that's perfectly fine, especially where you're at in the, in the world. You know, in another culture, and I believe that many times people, they don't even realize it, but they're being controlled by the enemy. In another culture, maybe like Papua New Guinea, a lot of that stuff may be absolutely normal. That's part of the culture. And then another a part of the world may be doing the exact same thing. But maybe when you get to a smaller town where perhaps it's a little bit more conservative, to see people like that walking around is strange. It's not normal uh, 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 what's going on. Again, those definitions vary depending on who you talk to. But ultimately, when it comes to the Word of God, we have to do what the Word of God is saying. It may not be normal to some folks, but it's normal to God. But there are many that believe that they are with God even still. The Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 15, verse 8, it says, This people draw up nigh unto me with their mouth. They honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Second, Tim Second Timothy chapter 2, Paul writing, declared this, Know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, 
For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those, those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. This is the part I wanted to get to, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. They deny the very power of God, and they turn away from it. He said that in the last days, we've been living in the last days, these perilous times were going to come. People think they're okay. They love, actually love God, or they love uh, pleasures more than they love God themselves. They just have all kinds of issues and, and all kinds of problems. So they may have a, uh, they may know how to quote certain scriptures. They may know how to say certain cliches. Uh, I'm blessed. I'm highly favored. The Lord is good. God is good all the time. They may say some of these things. So it's a form of godliness. Maybe they even know how to put on a nice suit of clothes uh, when they get ready to come to church. But when it's all said and done, at the end of the day, they deny the power thereof. Uh, or in other words, uh, they really don't believe in God. In serious business. How do people get to this place to where they suppose, they think it's customary, it's normal that God is with them, but he's not? They didn't think anything about it until it was too late. Until they couldn't, Jesus was nowhere in their sight. Where was he at? Perhaps he was, he was, um, he was somewhere playing with Pokemon cards. Oh, I know he wasn't. Perhaps he was somewhere just uh, on the beach with his feet up, taking it easy and counting seashells. No, he was, he was somewhere in a place where he needed to be. But they didn't understand. They were perhaps feeling kind of, I don't doubt for one second, Mary was, she was very distraught. Her heart was pounding really fast. How was it that I lost my son? Where did he go? I thought I was a decent parent. Why would he just leave all of a sudden? Book of Matthew chapter seven, I'm talking about these people supposing that they are with God. Matthew chapter seven says, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then, listen to what he says, and then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. But I've done so many things. Man, I'm the best soul when I brought the most people to church. I read my Bible. I, I did this. You won't even believe this one. I even paid my tithe. Why would anybody brag about that? Those are the things that we ought to be doing. We should be paying our tithe. We should be in church. We should be inviting people. But why would he say this? Depart from me. I never knew you. Could it be because these people were supposing that they were with the Lord? But there was really a part of them that was reserved. They kept the reserved part in their heart, especially for the world. It was not reserved for God. They kept a part in their heart to where they said, you know what? In case uh, this Christian stuff don't work out, I have a backup plan. In case these people don't want to be my friends, uh, which is not the case, I have a backup plan. In case it gets too strict and it feels like it's so much control and, and legalism, I have a backup plan, a, a place in my heart that's reserved to where I can go to the world and the world will accept me no matter what I do. No matter if I want to live with another man, even though I'm a man, it's quite all right. It doesn't matter if I sleep with the entire world, it's quite all right. It doesn't matter when I I get lonely and want to be with my cat. It's quite all right. It's not all right with God. Amen. The world is sick and on their way to hell. But so many people, you're, you're judging people. It's not judgment. Either a person is saved or they're not. Either they're living for God or they're not. Either they're on their way to heaven or they're not. He says, depart from me. I never knew you. How sad to be in a church that'll preach the gospel and tell men and women the truth. Nah, that stuff ain't for me. Deliberately make uh, provision for the flesh to go out there and do what the world is doing. 
I'm never going to do this, I'm never going to do that. And the very thing that they say that they're not going to do, Satan makes sure that's what they're going to do. This serious business. He says, depart from me. I never knew you. But what about those times when, when I was in the prayer meeting and then I did this and I did that? He said, these people, they, they've done many wonderful works. He says, many. He says, these people even cast out devils. He says, Lord, we, in your name, we cast out devils. But the Lord of glory will still say, I never knew you. Because he knows that there are people that just, it's just lip service. This is why Isaiah could say there, they draw nigh to me with their lips. They talk, they talk, they talk, but their heart is far from me. It's a problem when people have, they spend more time with people in the world. I'm not talking about you working on a job. I'm not talking about you have people in your family that are not saved. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about when a person don't want to be around the Christians and prefer to be around worldly people. People that take the name of the Lord in vain, people that drink, people that use drugs, people that curse, they do all kinds of stuff. And then you have those other people say, well, I just need some time to myself. I need to spend some time to myself, really, so that the enemy of your soul can continue to just penetrate your mind with every fiery dart he can possibly throw at you. And some people have already received those darts. They've already allowed the enemy to take those darts and infiltrate their mind and telling them that you don't need to be around the church. You don't need to be around the Christians. You don't need to be around that old pastor. How do you quarant how do you call yourself a child of God and you quarantine yourself from the people of God? That don't make sense to me. I'm not the one that's infected with sin. Hello. I'm not the one that's on my way to hell doing my own thing. No, I, call, I came out of darkness into the marvelous light of God. I cherish that moment. It is still serious business. But I just can do this. I can do that. What about the father's business? Now, as Mary was so frantic and she was worried and, and upset, maybe she even felt like, uh, her son had disrespected her in a way. Maybe, I don't know, that's supposition. So they, when they finally, and, and this is a part that's sad too, they sought for Jesus among their kinsfolk and acquaintance. It's sad if you cannot find Christ amongst your family and your friends. Does that mean you just separate and just cut yourself off from you? Your family is still your family. But when it comes to certain people who are friends, I have to keep my distance. Because if I don't, I already know I'm going to be infected by their problems, by their sins. So this is very, you got you to gotta tread softly. You got to be careful. So he was searched. They were searching for Jesus among them, but they couldn't find him. So they, find, they found him. Uh, then he turned back again to Jerusalem. And it came to pass in verse 46 that after three days, they found him in the temple sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. So Christ wasn't off to the side doing his own thing. He wasn't just going about and just trying to just make a social endeavor out of things. No. And it went on to say, all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and his answers. When they saw him, they were amazed. I can imagine as they went into this place of worship that they were looking at him like, wow, that, that is my son. I knew he was, it's almost like, Mary had to be reminded. He is the son of God. Yes, he's my son, but he is the Messiah. He is the son of God. How is he so smart to say that Christ was gifted? That's really an understatement. He's God. Uh, she was so amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou dost dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. It was so painful for them to be looking for him, and he was not around. It's a sad place to be in life when it comes to God. He had said unto them, how is it that ye sought me? He says, wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? The father's business. God is always about souls. That's his business. Christ is a soul winner. The Bible tells us in chapter four of John, it says, but he said unto them, 
I have meat to eat that ye know not of. Because during this time, Jesus' disciples had went out into the city to get something to eat while he stayed behind and he was talking to the Samaritan woman at the well. So by the time they came back, they were saying, Master, you, you, are you hungry? You need to eat. You, we know you haven't eaten. And he says, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. Therefore said the disciples one to another, hath any man brought him aught to eat? I don't recall. I thought we were all together. How is it that he was able, he was able to eat? We never gave him no food. Jesus said unto them, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. He says, Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look onto the fields. He says, For they are white already to harvest. He said, In other words, uh, he's telling them, Yes, you, yeah, you, you may think that I'm hungry and talking about some, some physical food, but this is a spiritual food. And really, my meat is to, to do the will of the one that sent me, and that is to reach the lost uh, for God, to reach out to one more soul, uh, to reach out to a, a person that is suffering, someone that is hurting, someone that don't know which way to turn. Uh, that's why he came. Uh, that's why he died. Uh, that's why he rose, uh, so that people could have life. Serious business. He says, the harvest is, 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 all, is white already, it's, it's already ripe. It's the, the, the souls that's in this world right now, it's, it's ripe for, for God to, to just save someone. I was thinking about this I, I, in my own testimony, and I, and I was just so thankful in my heart and soul for our church and our organization. And our ministry that we have here at this church and reaching out to the, to the military, as I was sharing with brother yesterday, I said servicemen's are homes, it, the ministry, it works. If it did not work, I would not be here almost 20 years later. Someone would have to be a buffoon or a stone cold idiot to try to persuade me otherwise. You're too late. God already saved me. God already filled me with the Holy Ghost. Uh, he's already been so good to me. He's done so many things like the song says, I cannot tell it all. So a person would be too late to tell me this stuff don't work. But the reason why a lot of times people don't make it in this, in this Christian race and in this type of ministry, really is because they want to do their own thing. I've had friends who left the ministry. I have friends who stopped coming to church. I, I've, that, that's just the way that it is sometimes. We don't rejoice over it. We can pray, you know, the Lord lays it on our heart. And when it comes up in our spirit, we can pray for these people. But they have to make up their mind what they want to do. We cannot force somebody to serve the Lord. We can't force somebody to come to church. We can't force somebody to do something that they don't want to do. But why would a person turn away and go the other way if this right here, it works? They got that special place in their heart that's reserved for the world. I'm going to make provision for the flesh to do what I want to do. Jesus says, I must be about my father's business. Now, many people have accused the Lord of many things over the years. Um, they called him a radical pretty much. They said all kinds of evil things about my savior. But he says, I must be about my father's business. What's the father's business? Reaching lost souls. As a Christian, why wouldn't you want to reach out to another person? Why wouldn't you want to reach out to someone that is hurting? He said in Luke chapter 4, verse 18, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal. Listen to what, the, listen to what God says. He has sent me, talking about the father, or the spirit, he sent me to heal the brokenhearted. This is the mission of the Lord. This is his father's business, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. He didn't send me to, to talk about politics over the pulpit. You vote for who you wanna vote for. Uh, that, that's between you and God. He didn't send me here to, to, to get on someone's case. He sent me here to preach the gospel. Why? So that when someone hears the gospel message, they can get saved. They can get delivered. And see, talk is cheap. Anybody can say that they're going to do this. I'm going to do this. Or 
you can just put up or shut up. No, I, I don't know about a whole lot in the world right now, but as one thing I know, like that blind man that came up, that Jesus came by and healed, he says, I once was blind, but, but now I see. The good Lord, he has given me my sight. I'm delivered. I'm changed. I'm healed in the presence of God. Amen. It's like I saw this, uh, I saw this short video of Mike Tyson. Many of us know who Mike Tyson is. Perhaps one of the greatest boxers of all time. If Muhammad Ali was alive, he would tell you he was the greatest. Uh, but he passed away a, a while ago. Everybody has their own opinion. Either way it goes, uh, Muhammad Ali, Mike Tyson, I, you can't pay me enough to get in the ring with them. I don't care how old he was. Muhammad Ali had Parkinson's disease towards the end of his life. I still ain't getting in the ring with him. But Mike Tyson, he's about in his 53, 54 years old. Swole, solid. Only thing about him changed really his age, and he had some, he had a gray hair, like a little goatee. And man, he was sparring with somebody. Woo, woo. You can't pay me to get in the ring with Mike Tyson. Brother, where's your faith? I'm telling you, this is my faith, okay? <laughs> I have enough faith to believe that it ain't going to work out between me and him. Ain't no sparring and going back and forth with Mike Tyson. They call him I am Mike for a reason, okay? But he was so fast and then he throwing these jabs and stuff and he was ducking and weaving and then he said, I'm back. Now, the only thing is, 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 is Mike Tyson trying to, to make a return and, and, and fight? What in the world? Preacher, what does this have to do with the gospel message? Talk is cheap. You see, he could back up what he's saying. He didn't have to, he don't have to really, he don't have to brag and boast about nothing. You could try to fight him if you want to. And I don't believe he's going to bite your ear off. He's going to punch it off. <laughs> but this Christian faith and this living, it, it's, it's, not for the, it's not for the faint of heart. It's not for the weak-minded. Anybody can be a sinner. We all were born into sin. Anybody can live the life of a sinner and keep on living it. But it takes a real man or a woman to stand up and say, I am a Christian. And I'm not telling you that just because uh, my parents were Christians. No, I am a Christian because I gave my heart and life to the Lord. I am born again by the Spirit of God. I confess my sins. I've asked the Lord to come into my life and change me and forgive me for all of my sins. I didn't ask the Lord to forgive me for one sin, for two sins. Well, that was my favorite sin, so let me hold on to that one. But God, you forgive me for all the other ones. It's all or nothing with God. It's time to put up or shut up. It's serious business. Let me give my very all to the Lord. Help me, God, to surrender every single day. Could you imagine the Lord of glory went to the cross and he didn't give us his all? He didn't give us his best? No, nah, but Rabbis, I cannot allow myself to take your place. First of all, you're a murderer. You, you're a, you, you know, this guy over here, he's a thief. You're an insurrectionist. I ain't dying for none of y'all. Both of y'all crazy and you're on your way to hell. You die for yourself. That's another version of the gospel altogether. Man, it don't matter how vile somebody is. Jesus loves them. Amen. And he died for them. Yeah. Whether it was a, a mass murderer, whether it was a, a communist dictator that mistreated everybody in the country, him, he fat and jolly walking around like he the man and this, that, and the other, and people in this country starving and, and can't get no good food. Uh, hey, Jesus loves that person too. Amen. Jesus died for that person too. Hopefully they can make their peace with the Lord before it's too late. It's always serious business with God. Always. And I don't believe the Lord was being disrespectful to his mother, but he was just really, and I, and I believe he asked that question because the angel had already told her about this, um, about Christ coming. And so she already had some, some, some foreknowledge of, of what the Lord was going to do in her life. So it's almost like she was kind of, and this is supposition, almost like she got a little over familiar with God. And so the Lord had to remind her. He says, how is it that you were searching for me? You should already know I must be about the father's business. I don't have time for arcades and Pokemon cards right now. There are souls that are lost. These Jews got their own way of thinking. I'm going to help them get it straightened out. 
I'm the Messiah. I'm the one that Moses talked about. I'm the one that the, that the patriarchs talked about. I'm the one they said, well, Abraham's our father, really. Before Abraham was, I was. I am and am to come. <laughs> you know, that might not be good English, but whatever. Hey, nobody can outdo God. None of us are smarter than God. But she, the Bible tells in verse 50, they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. What that little bit that he shared with them, they didn't understand. Unfortunately, there are people like that today. They still don't understand the business of God. And anybody, I, I think I've shared this several times, uh, you can come to the instruments as we get ready to close. You know, God didn't call me here because of my great intellect, wisdom, or what have you. He called me because I was willing. It's a big difference. Some people, they're not willing. They're willing to do a lot of other things, but they're not willing to just surrender to the Lord. Well, if I surrender all the way, then I can't have, God is going to take my friends away. He's going to take things away from me and I can't have fun anymore. Come on now, really? Anybody in their right mind, can, can we really say that God is going to take our fun away from us? I've had more fun since I've been saved than I was in the world. There's nothing fun about going to the club, blowing your money, and listening to this super loud music and everything else. And you're searching and searching, and you still come up empty. You go to the club, you perhaps you're looking for satisfaction, and then you leave, you still feel empty. There's still a void. There's still a hole. You're still searching. So how is it that I had so much more fun when I was out there in the world? I've had more fun since I've given my life over to the Lord. At least I can remember what I did the night before. At least I can come to people and just be real. At least my heart can be pure. At least my heart can be righteous. I'm not trying to do anything to hurt someone. I'm not trying to do anything to get over on someone, to take advantage of someone. There's nothing fun about that. But what is it so bad about being in the presence of other believers? Some people that can encourage you. Some people that can tell you, I'm praying for you. I love you. I don't want you to fail, but I can not do all the praying for you is a part that we all have to do on our own and pray for people I love them but if someone wants to destroy themselves and many times God will allow someone to come by our way to be the voice of reason but if a person has already reasoned away in their heart why they can't come to church why they can't be around Christian fellowship and um, unfortunately this this COVID-19 is really just a cover for people. They've already, they were having problems before COVID-19. And if they don't make their peace with God, they're going to continue to have problems when this pandemic is over. You see, it's too late in the game. It's serious business, church. Serious business. I don't want to be that person that just have a form of godliness. Why can't I be godly? I don't just want the form. I, I want to be godly. I want to have the same attributes like God. A God that's loving, that's caring, that's compassionate, that wants to help others. Serious business. With heads, heads bowed and eyes closed in reference to the Lord, God is here to meet the needs in our hearts and in our lives. Nothing, of, of course, was shared to hurt anyone's feelings. But God is still merciful, and he's still reaching out, and he still loves. And it's up to us to take heed to what his word is saying. We don't ever want to get to that place where we're supposing that God is with us, and he's not. We got our eyes off of him, and we don't even know where he's at. It's dangerous. We have to come to the Lord, repent while there's still time, surrender, and give him our very all. Let's all find a place to pray and spend time with, with God. He's here.